Hey, it's Kyle Meredith, and welcome to Kyle Meredith With, an audio interview series presented by WFPK, Independent Louisville, and Consequence of Sound. My guest today, Kim Gordon, formerly of Sonic Youth. We get to talk about the 20th anniversary of their album, A Thousand Leaves, and the 30th anniversary of Daydream Nation, as well as what she's been up to musically, what we can expect. Yes, there is a solo album in the works and how her famous line from the song Cool Thing has been used uh, on plenty of posters for the Me Too movement. It's Kyle Meredith with Kim Gordon. Oh, hey, hi. Let's start out with just, you know, what what you've been up to because the last we heard of you musically (laughs) was uh, Uh you you put out the single Murdered Out, and that was 2016, and it was a one-off single, but I thought at the time, surely I thought, oh, this means that there's more on the way, maybe, I don't know, a solo record or something, and that assumption Mm -hmm. was wrong. (laughs) <laughs> um, well, I am going to do a solo record. I'm not sure. I, I don't think I'm doing it with that person, but uh, who I worked with on that. But uh, it's going to be uh, the person that I'm working with is really busy. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, I don't know. It's, it might take a while. <laughs> yeah. So no timeline on that. But w- was that ever the um, was that ever the thought when that song came out that the, you, you I mean that there was going to uh, be more to go with it, or was that always meant to be a one off? Well, you know, I just really hadn't. It was just something that happened, so I hadn't really, um, you know, planned anything more right then. I mean, it was kind of, uh, everything takes so long. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, and now Body had, we have a record coming out um, in July, July 13th, yeah. on Matador, so. Oh, with Body Head? Um, yeah. So if I do have a solo record, it'll be like next year. You're also on the new Steve Malcolmus record, I've heard. Which yes, is, I am. What, what's your involvement there? What do you what, what do you what are you uh, what are you doing on that record? Oh, I'm just doing a duet. It's like a it's just sort of a faux country song about marriage, I think. <laughs> yeah, so that was fun. Can you uh, can you tell me about any more about the Body Head record while we're here? Is that just, still? It's really heavy, <laughs> and uh, I don't know what to think of the Body Head record, but <laughs> it's. Uh, it's quite different than the first one. So, yeah. I don't know. It's just heavy. Let's do A Thousand Leaves, because this album is turning 20 on May 12th. Um, I, I don't feel like this is an album that gets celebrated very often. I mean, there's just so many, you know, Sonic Youth records that people turn to. And I, this one's sort of... I want to tell you, I had the poster of that on my wall for, like, most of my the second half of my teenage years. <laughs> oh, wow. Take the trip down memory lane. Like, what comes to mind, if anything, when you think back to that record? Well, I mean, I know that we were, um, I think it was very influenced by, uh, you know, having our own studio and we'd been putting out, um, doing these kind of more instrumental, kind of just more experimental things on SYR. What was our last more kind of really song oriented record? Was, was it Dirty? No, it was. It was uh, uh, experimental jet set, I think. Yeah, yeah, jet set and washing machine between this one and Dirty. washing machine. Yeah, yeah, and then a thousand leaves was after washing machine, mm-hmm. or was it? Yeah, that's right. Anyway, I guess we sort of, you know, washing machine. <laughs> I'm talking about another record. That's all right. Uh, I think we felt like that was a really good recording experience. It felt the recording felt very naturalistic, and you know the whole. A kind of career of Sonic Youth, the whole time people would always say, oh, your records don't sound like you do live, you know, and and I think after a while we sort of gave up trying to do that because also it's kind of dumb because people are listening to something out of giant speaker, you know, mm-hmm. and it's, you know, it's just a live experience. This is totally different. I mean, some people really try to replicate their records, I guess. And that's like a point of kind of honor, or not honor, but to be exacting in that way. And um, we were never that sort of band anyway. So um, I think that though there was something about, you know, the recordings that seemed always to separate us from the music, which is, and the feeling of playing live and what the music sounded like playing live. So Washing Machine felt even though it did have a lot of reverb on things, I think, uh, it did feel like a kind of naturalist kind of sounding record. And so when we went back to our own studio, which actually we we could have our own studio because we then toured Lollapalooza and we took some of that money and invested it and made our own studio. So we could then record more and 
uh, we started doing these like SYR records because that we didn't want to be put through some like bigger, big kind of record company machinery of prom- promotion and blah, 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 blah. Because it's so frustrating. You know, you just, you have to wait so long to put a record out. <laughs> anyway, so A Thousand Leaves, I think, was very influenced by that process. When I look back, especially, you know, 1998, I thought the old scene, you know, that, that you guys had released Goo and Dirty in, that sort of drifted out by that point. You know, we're getting into the late 90s, almost to the mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. rap rock and, and cock rock takeover uh, of radio mm-hmm. and everything. Right. But I thought, you know, it, it's it, it almost was probably a nice thing for you all because once that certain spotlight had kind of shifted that way, it seems like it would take the pressure off. Because when I listen to this now, when I listen to A Thousand Leaves now, it almost sounds like one of the first times that Sonic Youth sounded like you were really comfortable and on your own speed. Yeah, that's. I guess that's what I mean by naturalistic or something. Like we weren't sort of trying something out that was out of our comfort zone in a way. I mean, you know, seriously, we, we recorded, uh, we like to record it through sound because they had like a two inch and, you know, it's very analog sounding and, and all that. But, you know, I even remember the last record we recorded there, I guess maybe it was experimental, like working with Butch Big. We kind of got into this thing of saying, well, that's good enough, <laughs> you know, instead of going back and, redoing take after take because i feel like with like dirty and goo you know we we basically really took the rock thing as far as we could Mm -hmm. and then ultimately found it sort of less satisfying when we saw where it was kind of going like you were saying also like we kind of just hit a wall with it and then it's almost like we just became more introverted (laughs) or something (laughs) yeah so that sort of makes sense yeah that's when i started loving sonic youth the most when you became introverted (laughs) Oh, of course. I mean, I, I don't even remember what that, what's on that record or what it sounds like, to tell you the truth. Well, there's there's uh, three, uh, yeah. three songs that I'll bring up. Um, first, Sunday was the big single uh, off of it, was, I guess, the oh, only okay. yeah, single yeah, yeah. off of it, which, as yeah. I look back on now, I don't remember seeing it, but you had Macaulay Culkin in the video? Right, yeah. It was sort of Thurston and Macaulay Culkin. Oh, okay. I, I think Harmony shot it, Harmony Corinne. Yeah. Yeah. I see him. And back. it was kind of like he had this idea he wanted to do, so... You know, a couple of your s- songs that I'll point out, um, especially because it, there's always, with a lot of your lyrics, they've held on, they, they've they've aged well, and I'm going to say they aged well in really fortunate and interesting ways because uh, the first track is, uh, I'm going to try to say it, Contre le Sexism, um, which I think uh. transfers to Against Sexism, and then the Female Mechanic. And listening to those okay. now and the things that you were talking about, uh, and all the way back, especially to your very famous line and cool thing that people are holding up on posters everywhere now. You know, this all eventually comes out to the Me Too movement that's been in the last uh, the last year or two years and everything. And I don't know if you have a reaction to that, a feeling of that, but that's got to have some kind of positive effect on you that I would think. Well, and it's, it's funny. I mean, I actually, but it's sort of like the way the media works and it's just sort of like, well, sexism didn't just happen now. <laughs> You know, so, you know, and I don't know, I guess when we signed to major label, I think I really felt like, okay, I actually have a platform here that like, I can write a song about anything. And it almost kind of, I felt challenged by it. Like, I, you know, to step up to the plate or something like so many people write love songs or that. And it's kind of like, well, as a woman, I had so many things I could write songs about as subject matter. And, um, like there was like swimsuit issue, mm-hmm. you know, like right after we signed a guest and I think there was kind of a big A&R person who was called out for sexual harassment and, um, and it was kind of a big deal. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I think we felt not only had we signed to like, you know, accused of selling out signing to a major label, but it was like one that had this particular scumbag, <laughs> you know, but of course it was just like, he was probably the tip of the iceberg or, you know, like no one just talked about it. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, I was really, I really deeply felt like uh, the sexism coming from this corporate world and, um, you know, things like they'd have like secretary day, um, oh. but they wouldn't necessarily like give help kind of nurture secretaries into other jobs or, you know, like promoting them or, you know, and, you know, so that was kind of, I, you know, I think it's uh, 
funny. It's just funny how things come around. They don't go away, you know. And uh, but I, I actually had totally forgotten that I written that song. <laughs> <laughs> Until, well, I guess, and well, also female mechanic. You know, I don't. You know, I just kind of. I guess I, what the nice thing I guess that I'm trying to to say with that is, you know, when we would see those stories in the '90s. It was almost like those people, even if they got in trouble, it would just be like a stern slap on the wrist a lot of the time. Oh, yeah. And I don't know about the the situation you're specifically speaking to, but a lot of times that happened. Whereas now it feels like, you know, whether whether the huge ball keeps rolling in the way that we all hope it does. But, you know, those Mm -hmm. those mountains are starting to crumble. And, and, And like I said, to for you to be such a voice of that and and interestingly, with words you said 20 years ago and 25 years ago to still have such an impact and, and to be so inspiring, you know, to women marching and, and, you know, traveling across the country to, to, to walk on Washington. Yeah, no, I don't know. Like, it was it's so funny because it was just such a, but that inspiration for the cool thing lyrics came from a couple different sources. And I almost meant it like, it was just like one of those lyrics on the, they did actually eventually, I guess now they mean something. <laughs> but I, I, I was kind of thinking of, uh, of uh, you know, I was inspired by a Raymond Pettibone film and Jane Fonda and L. Cool J. You know, like, it was, but uh, yeah. I mean, it, it is interesting. Okay. I don't know if you really think it's, I, I just feel like, I guess I'm a little pessimistic, though. I, I just kind of feel like people have such short attention spans and it is like all the, sexual harassment stories coming out it's all kind of built on like such a culture of sexism you know that it's so deeply ingrained and it's genetically and ingrained and i don't know i just hope it's so uh, keeps moving forward with some momentum you know yeah i think it's just everyone's so starved for that change to finally happen because it's been so long coming it's such yeah, a long that, that time could coming. Be, you know. Yeah, but yeah, at the it's same been time, pressed so long. Yeah, at the same time, we have a dude in the office who has been sued by dozens of women, and nothing right. will happen. Nothing will happen. Yeah, because there's so many kind of uh, white male kind of you know small thinkers in the office, and I don't think we're going to solve the world's problem with that. But <laughs> <laughs> I do appreciate you. Uh, in, in that in that sort of idea right there, as I know a lot of folks uh, do. That's um, great, thanks. So let's turn to another record then, uh, which you pointed out to me. I I, <laughs> I hadn't been I wasn't paying attention to the thirty year anniversary, but in October, uh, Daydream Nation turns thirty years, and I think every I feel like everything's been said about that record because there are literally books written about that record. <laughs> How does it sit with you in a catalog, you know, to be held on such a pedestal like that? Like, do you have the same emotions that I think people uh, ri- give that album rise to? Um, you know, I I sort of didn't until we, um, you know, because once a record's done, you just kind of, you sort of have to forget about it. And then you go out and you play the songs and they take on sort of a new a life of their own. But when we did relearn the, that record and start playing it live again, I it had such a different feeling than all our other songs after that. And you know, it's like it's so dense, and it was actually just such an intense uh, 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 thing to play. But like listening to it, I don't know. It's not as I didn't get the the sense of the songs individually of having that much power. But actually playing the songs was really hard <laughs> and in in the sense that it was just really a lot of energy and and maybe it was also coming out of uh you know being influenced by hardcore and just you know, super like dense kind of music that was around us yet at that time it ends up being you know i guess your most accessibly <laughs> as a pop record that you guys had ever done it, which is interesting uh, that that's what the influences were coming from you know that um, you ended up on the charts with that yeah. record. Yeah, it's, it's weird. Yeah, were, uh, yeah. Were you aware? <laughs> uh, well, I guess I should say, when did you start to become aware that it was taking on that life that it eventually did? I don't know. You know, it was just a kind of gradual, I guess, because people would, yeah, mention it as in you know, our best record or something. Like that. Yeah, it's in the Library of Congress now. 
<laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. That was a moment. I forgot. And I remember, yeah, being like we're in Japan or something when they had the Paz and Jap pull. And it was like number one. And I remember being just completely surprised. I don't know. I mean, to have, you know, we talk about these records, to have something that dominated your life for 30 years and, and then for it to be done and gone. Do, do you feel the absence of Sonic Youth or is it still people like me making it constantly circle around you? <laughs> I mean, I don't feel the absence of it because I kind of felt like we sort of took it as far as we could. And I don't know, also I'm just kind of sort of busy with other things. Now able to like assume making art more, um, which is kind of the most important thing to me. And also I love playing with Bill. Like I just, I love playing, I love body head. You know, I just it's kind of just, I love the freedom of it. And that's, you know, I'll try not to make that part of the, this interview too awkward either, because, you know, it's well written about how Sonic Youth kind of came to an end and why it came to an end, you know, without getting into your personal life. But, but that was sort of the question, you know, like had Sonic Youth made their final record one way or the other, was, was that happening regardless? Yeah. I mean, it's possible, you know, I think, um, you know, when it gets, you know, I think that we had a lot of good times and good moments and kind of amazing that the band was able to become as big as it was. I, you know, I just can't imagine what it would be like starting a band now <laughs> that was, you know, writing songs or indie rock or whatever. And like, I, I just kind of feel pretty much like, you know, dynamics in a band get old and it's kind of like it's better to stop before, you know, it's just all the good times get forgotten, you know. <laughs> right, right. There's a lot of great music in there. Um, I certainly do appreciate every bit of it. I, I'm, I'm always excited about what you're doing next. Like I said, I thought Murdered Out was, was I, I was so taken aback by it. One, I, it just kind of came out of nowhere, but it was such a good song and so great to hear you sort of in that um, in that style and mode as well uh -huh. so yeah no I, I would i would like to do more actually with that producer too i think you know i might i i probably will but i think um there'll be like six, one offs or something well yeah. i thank you for the time uh especially uh, you gave me a lot of time here i really appreciate that but um oh sure yeah and i look forward to um to the new body head so maybe we can uh you know ch catch up more when that when that happens and uh and we'll, we'll yeah definitely we'll get bill on the phone too and make it a big thing Cool. All right. <laughs> well, take care. Um, is there anything else we should know about? Actually, I should ask. You just did an art show, so I didn't know if you had any more of those coming up. That was. Uh... Oh yeah. Well, it's um, it's up until the twenty eighth in L A. There's like a narr There's actually a kind of a narration part to it, as well as the painting and sculpture, and there's like sound effects in the room and stuff. Where is it? It's at this um, gallery in L A. called Rena Spalling's Fine Art. They have one in New York, and then they share the space with. Um, another gallery from Mexico City. They kind of, every other month, they curate a show. And yeah, I'm really happy with it. Yeah, and how long is that up? Until uh, April 28th. Well, awesome. Um, I don't think I can get to April in that time, but I hope some of our listeners <laughs> can. So, uh, yeah. awesome, Kim. Well, thank you so much again, and uh, it was great talking to you. You too. All Have right. a great day. You too. Bye. Bye. Thanks so much to Kim Gordon for giving me the call today. Don't forget to subscribe to Consequence of Sounds at YouTube channel to keep up with your favorite artists and interviews and WFPK.org. That's where I do a show every Monday through Thursday from noon to 3 Eastern. I'm Kyle Meredith, and I'll see you next time.